Howdy and welcome to Burley United Methodist Worship Service for uh, Labor Day weekend for Sunday, the September 3rd. We are grateful you could tune us in. Uh, school year is already going. We are having uh, three Bible studies that are occurring. One will start next week uh, on 9-11 at 7 o'clock. We will be kind of doing about a 20,000 feet view of uh, the Gospel of Luke. We'll meet on Monday nights. At, we'll meet at 6.30. And if you'd like to jump, please, please join us. We are very grateful. Uh, and then hopefully to invite everyone who would like to come. Our opening, our, our call, our, uh, our opening hymn this morning is Abide With Me. The call to worship this morning comes from uh, the 84th Psalm uh, and uh, the letter to Hebrews. I'll read the light print and ask you to respond in the bold. Come from east and west, north and south. Join in songs of praise to the living God. How lovely is your dwelling place, O God of hosts. My soul longs, yea, faints for the courts of God. God breaks the yokes of oppressors and brings people back from their exile. A day in your courts, O God, is better than a thousand elsewhere. God sent Jesus as mediator of a new covenant to bring us all to God's way of peace. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Please join me in the opening prayer. We come before you, God of hosts, in reverence and awe, for you are a consuming fire. You are far greater than we can imagine, judging, 
transforming and upholding, grant us to enter by the narrow door and to walk uprightly today and every day. Bless our time together that we may be a blessing to others. We meet along life's way. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is, O Spirit of the Living God. Seventy-eight years ago yesterday, World War II ended. On that day in Tokyo Bay, as the warring powers gathered together, the dawn was gray. And as the Japanese delegation considered the weather symbolic of their ancestors weeping, as they climbed alongside the ladder of the USS Missouri to formally surrender to their nation. They were met by General of the Army, Douglas MacArthur, and representatives of the other, of, of nine, of the other eight Allied powers. And at nine o'clock, General MacArthur stepped to the microphone and he opened and he shared these words. We gather here, representative of the major warring powers to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The issues involving divergent ideals and ideologies have been determined on the battlefields of the world and hence are not for our discussion or debate nor is it for us to meet, representing as we do a majority of the peoples of the earth in a spirit of distrust, malice, or hatred, but rather it is for us, both victors and vanquished, to rise to that higher dignity which alone befits the sacred purposes we are about to serve. And after the 10 signatories had signed the peace treaty, General MacArthur concluded the short ceremony with these reverent words. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world, that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are closed. And at that moment, an armada of 250 aircraft flew over the Missouri and the sun broke out. Finally, from behind the clouds, shining on a world at peace, World War II was over. Let us come this day and pray.
loving God, have mercy upon us. And you, O Lord, who transforms our weaknesses into strength, receive the prayers we lovingly offer on behalf of the church and of the world. Our world today is an anxious place divided by ideologies, and we grow more stubborn and impertinent. Break down the barriers that exist among peoples and nations. Restore and strengthen our common life. Give to your church a bold vision and a daring love to speak and act on behalf of your mission to restore all people and creation in peace. Teach us to trust simply and to travel light together. Comfort all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Expand our compassion. Increase our faith. And make us whole as we work together for the healing of those in need. Eternal God, we remember those who are dying and those who have died. Draw them to you, heavenly, to your heavenly realm with you. Christ and the Holy Spirit, that they may dwell with you in paradise. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we look last week at the barriers that can inhibit us from reaching out with the gospel of Christ, I want us this week to look at some of the barriers that we construct. The message of the gospel is about one's forgiveness of sins and that salvation is available to all through faith in Jesus Christ. The great poet laureate Robert Frost was asked, what is the worst word in the English language? And for a moment he thought, and then he said, exclusion. When we exclude people from our lives, we harm not only them, but ourselves as well. Jesus excludes no one. Jesus came down to tear down the walls that divide people and to build bridges for people to cross. God loves all of us so much that God was willing to send his only son. And for him to sacrifice his life for all of this to happen. We have reasons to build walls instead of bridges. And I hope last week that I brought up some of the shortcomings and convinced you that barriers are not God's will. Judaism is an ancient religion. An idea took root some time, centuries before Jesus, that while salvation was for all, the Jews thought that such a gift should just be kept. within those of the faith. See if you can pick up this hint of exclusivity here in Genesis 12 as God spoke to Abram, because I can't. And God said, and I will make for you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all 
the families of the earth shall be blessed. When God chose Abram, God established Israel not because they were the greatest or the most righteous or the most deserving, but as an act of God's grace. God decided them to make them an instrument in bringing the world into a relationship with him. And to commemorate this inclusive connection, God changed Abram's name, which meant father to Abraham. And there it says that you are an important father, a father of many nations now. And God also changed Sarah's name, meaning princess, to now meaning mother of the multitudes. The Apostle Paul would echo all of this in his letter to the churches in Galatia. And if you, belonging to Christ, when you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul was writing to Gentiles here, not to Jews. Before Moses died, he told the people of Israel that they were about to enter their promised land. And he shared them these words. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the earth to be his, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than the other people that God set you his heart on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that God has brought you out with a mighty hand. Chosen people. How do you see yourself as chosen? I see it as an honor. Being promoted in one's job is an honor because not everyone gets promoted. But as we read in scripture, to those who are much given, much is expected. God called me to do what I do, and it is an honor. And because of that, I am here as your servant, not as some despot. God's words in Genesis 12 is a call to servitude, to take what has been given and to share it so that others too may enjoy and live in God's love. But what happened over the centuries was that being the chosen people, the Jews ignored their call to service and replaced it with pride. It was this feeling of pride that the Holy Spirit confronted Peter in his vision in chapter 10 of Acts. This vision challenged the prejudices against Gentiles. Gentiles were seen as out of bounds, never to be touched, a threat of becoming an outcast yourself. Last week I asked you to think about those whom you have placed as out of bounds, those who are off limits to you. My justifications are based on fear and prejudice. Today, our, we are looking at Peter who was willing to have his biases not only challenged, but trashed, overcoming a huge barrier that radicalized the church once and for all. Peter responded to the Holy Spirit who prompted him to visit a Gentile in his house. There are very few people in the New Testament that I identify more with than Cornelius, a good guy, a Gentile, an army officer. We pick up the story in Acts 10, starting with verse 23. So Peter invited these Gentiles in 
and gave them lodging. And the next day he got up and went with them. And some of the believers accompanied Peter. And following day, they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. On seeing Peter arriving, on Peter's arrival, Cornelius fell at Peter's feet and worshiped him. But Peter made him get up saying, stand up. I'm a man just like you. Peter told Cornelius, in essence, I'm not Jesus, but I work for him. Early on, when I was an army chaplain, I was called to the hospital twice to meet with families of loved ones who had died. One boy had imitated a professional wrestling move that had gone, that he had seen on TV that had gone wrong. And the other was a teenager who for some reason with a group of his friends decided to play the lethal game of Russian roulette. I had not known the families beforehand, but when I showed up and walked into the family waiting room and they saw the, 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 the cross on my collar, instantly I was family. They were crying and, and, and seeking counsel and comfort and care. I had no answers. I just let the Holy Spirit work through me as I spent most of the next week with them. The words I spoke came from the Holy Spirit because that's all I had. What you can do when you are with those families in need is to show and allow the love of God's spirit to shine through you. If you were like me, you live a simple life. You live for Jesus. You appreciate everything. And you are blessed by all of those whom you meet. Chuck Swindoll wrote to Chuck wrote this to preachers and pastors. If God is using you specifically in a particular way, it is your responsibility to make sure that God's people keep their eyes on the Lord and not on you. Meanwhile, let them see the cracks in your life. Be like the kids who build the summertime clubhouse in the backyard and establish three rules. Nobody act big. Nobody act small. Everybody act medium. Peter had a vision where he had to deal with his barriers, his prejudices against Gentiles. Peter went in and found many Gentiles and he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent, for I came without objection, now may I ask why you sent for me? I don't even think at this point that Peter was comfortable being in a Gentile house. But he was there because God sent him and that was enough for him. Cornelius replied, four days ago, I was praying when suddenly an angel in dazzling clothes stood before me and he said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard and your alms have been received before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon who is called Peter, therefore, I sent for you immediately and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us here in the presence of God to listen to all that the Lord has commanded you to say. If you are keeping count over these weeks, this is the third time that Cornelius has been called a good man. You might remember from last week that when those who were sent to find Peter told him that Cornelius 
that they told Peter that he was, that Cornelius was a righteous man. And in the beginning of the story, Luke recorded that Cornelius was devout, praying to God regularly and giving generously to the poor and needy. Cornelius is like us. We are people of faith, of virtues, and of value. But even with all of that, there was something missing in Cornelius' life. He didn't have a personal relationship with God. He was religious, but there was something missing. You can read the four Gospels and and maybe a, a small paperback commentary on each of the Gospels, and you will know a lot about Jesus. But there's a huge difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. There's a song, I think, way back in the 70s from Scott Wesley Brown entitled, I'm Not Religious, I Just Love the Lord. One of the stanzas goes like this. Well, you can go to church every Sunday and think it's kind of neat, but the good Lord wants your love full time, seven days a week. You can give away everything you own and even give it to the poor. But listen, my friend, in the end, you gotta love the Lord. Well, you can look real pious, even spiritual, dress up, in your pride, but religion's just a mask you wear and God sees you as you are inside. Acting like a Pharisee, pretending you're a saint, fooling everybody you know, but God doesn't need your stained glass faith. He just wants your soul. Don't go to church before you go to Jesus. Don't go to church before you go to Jesus. And there's no doubt about that. I really, really want to shout it out again, singing, I'm not religious, but I love the Lord. I'm not religious, but I love the Lord. The story goes on. Then Peter said to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but Jesus raised him on the third day and allowed him to drink with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The message of peace in God is found through the person of Jesus Christ. The message of his crucifixion and resurrection is offered to everyone. We are commanded to share the gospel and to be a witness as the only and one judge of the living and the dead. The Apostle Paul would write to the church of Rome, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Those who decided to reject Jesus, receive punishment. 
And for those who believe, forgiveness for their sins, salvation. Believe in Jesus and receive eternal life. I don't want anyone to have heard me share a message and think, whatever. Don't let someone you know settle for judgment when eternal salvation is on your lips. All one has to do is bow, repent, and turn to Jesus. Nothing is more important than this. Today's homework is when you get home, open up your book and find, open up your Bible and find the book of Revelation. Turn back one page to the book of Jude. It's all of 25 verses. Read them all. Jude, the brother of Jesus, has such words that were written 2,000 years ago, and yet they are for us today. No one gets to heaven except by knowing Jesus. The story concludes. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The Jewish believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles, for they had heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And so Peter ordered them all to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord was not alone when he went to the cross. Two thieves were placed beside him, one on one side, one on the other. One thief only had words of derision and scorn for Jesus, but the other, the other, in his last hours of life, saw clearly the truth that yes, he deserved to be on the cross, but surely Jesus did not. And he said, Jesus, will you remember me? I don't deserve to be remembered by you, but I believe in you. Save me. May God bless us and our souls and in the souls of all the Corneliuses that they too will believe and receive. Let us pray. Gracious God, in these quiet moments, we have caught a glimpse of your glory. Inspire us to carry into the everydayness of our lives and drive and desire to experience your presence in our lives. May our faith have feet and hands, a voice and a heart that it may minister to others, that the gospel we profess may shine in our faces and be seen in our lives. May your blessing rest upon all who care for others, our service members, our first responders, physicians and nurses in our hospitals, our teachers and our administrators who teach and guide our children and our grandchildren. May each of us in our daily service come to know the love of being a servant and being kind to others. This we pray in your most holy name and all of God's people said, amen. It is the tradition of this church that as we gather on the first Sunday of each month that we take part in communion, the Last Supper. And so we do that today with juice and bread. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, that which I have received I give to you, that on the night of our Lord's arrest he took bread and he blessed it 
And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, drink of this, all of you, for the remission of your sins. For as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we come to you and we give you thanks for this time, this sacred time to be with you, to remind ourselves of your sacrifice on the cross for us. Each time we do this, O oh Lord, we are reminded that you are the host and we are the guests. We thank you, O oh Lord, for inviting us, for letting us partake to be a part of your family. May we this day feel your presence and share that presence, that love with others. This we pray in your name, amen. And our final song this morning is Marching to Zion.
And as we prepare to go, go in peace, trusting even where you have not been. And may God, our guardian, protect you. Christ, the healer, restore you. And may the Holy Spirit sustain you this day and forevermore. Amen.